Hi, this is Didi Khan, a Frenchie from the movie Grease, and you're listening to Real Talk with the Hollywood Kid. Of all the gin joints in all the towns in all the world, she walks into mine. And now, a show for retro movie and TV lovers everywhere. Interviews with some of the biggest stars in showbiz. It's a big W, I tell you. It's a big W. Real talk with the Hollywood kid. Senator, we're both part of the same hypocrisy. But never think it applies to my family. With Mike Destasio. Burn you! And here's your host, the Hollywood Kid. All right, good afternoon and welcome back to another edition of Real Talk with the Hollywood Kid. I am Mike D'Astasio. I am the Hollywood Kid, often imitated but never duplicated. Okay, folks, as part of our ongoing series on famous Hollywood murder mysteries, this week's edition of Real Talk with the Hollywood Kid will feature the murder of famed actress Natalie Wood. This month marks the 37th anniversary of her death. The death of actress Natalie Wood has been shrouded in mystery ever since the day her lifeless body was discovered off the coast of Catalina Island on Thanksgiving weekend, 1981. That weekend, Natalie Wood had been out on her yacht, The Splendor, with her husband, actor Robert Wagner, and actor Christopher Walken, and also the ship's captain, Dennis DeVerne was also on board. What happened on that fateful night remains a mystery. Robert Wagner wrote in his memoir that he had an argument with Christopher Walken the night Natalie Wood disappeared. It was a while later, after he had calmed down, that Wagner had noticed that Natalie Wood and the yacht's dinghy were both missing. Famed coroner Dr. Noguchi ruled her death an accidental drowning. New witnesses have come forward since then. In 2011, the case has been reopened by the LAPD, and they now consider Robert Wagner a person of interest. On today's episode, I will be joined by an expert on this case who has co-written a book with the ship's captain, Dennis DeVerne, on what happened on that fateful night. All right, my guest this afternoon has co-written a book with the captain of the boat, on the captain of the boat, The Splendor, Dennis DeVerne, called Goodbye Natalie, Goodbye Splendor. In it, they answer a lot of lingering questions that still remain to this day. They also participated in a 13-part podcast about this case called The Fatal Voyage, The Mysterious Death of Natalie Wood, which you can hear on iTunes. And today we will get answers in detailed information as to what actually happened on the night Natalie Wood lost her life. Author Marty Rooley joins me. Marty, first of all, thank you so much for joining me this afternoon. And thank you for having me. Okay, Marty, first of all, tell my audience, give my audience a little brief background about yourself and also your relationship to the captain of the boat, Dennis DeVerne. I am a personal friend of Dennis's, and we met when I was a teenager, and Dennis, when he... I, I, a few years after he got out of the uh, Navy, he was honorably discharged, and he liked being on the ocean, but he liked doing that as a civilian. So he started working at docks, and he moved from our home state of New Jersey to Florida. And he, with a crew, he took a boat, cruised it to Marina del Rey in California, and at the time, Robert Wagner and Natalie Wood, the famous Hollywood couple that had been married twice, were yacht shopping. And they liked this boat named Dizzy Izzy, and they purchased it and named it the Splendor, and they hired Dennis. And Dennis and I always remained close. He worked for the Wagners for about seven years, and we talked throughout the entire time he worked for them. So being a fan of Natalie Wood since I was a child, I, I just loved that one of my best friends worked for Natalie Wood. Right. So I got to know a lot about her through Dennis because he became very close with the Wagner family. He became like a family member. Their kids called him Uncle Dennis. He was always invited to their home for special occasions. He had carte blanche on the boat. He lived on the boat, as a matter of fact. 
and always went to their house for different occasions, especially over the holidays. So that's how um, I knew Dennis and how I learned more about the Wagner family. And then when the tragedy of Natalie's death happened, Dennis needed to stay quiet, as he was ordered to do by Robert Wagner, but he needed also to rid himself of the guilt for not having told the entire right, truth right, right. when I, they found I, Natalie. So Marty, he called I, me. I want to. Uh, I, I, I want to. I want to set up the set up the day for for my audience. Um, this actually this is airing on the the thirty. This is the thirty seventh anniversary of her, of her death. The month of the thirty seventh anniversary of her death. I want to set up that that day that they went out sailing because the weather conditions weren't weren't very good to be sailing that day. The weather conditions were horrible. It was Thanksgiving weekend, November 1981, and Natalie had been filming Brainstorm on location in North Carolina with co-star Christopher Walken. They were finished with location shooting, came back to Los Angeles, where Natalie lived. Um, Christopher Walken lived on the East Coast, but there was still some studio work to be done the week after Thanksgiving, and then the movie would be a wrap. But Natalie decided for the holiday weekend, Christopher Walken was all alone, so she invited him to Thanksgiving dinner at the Wagner house. I believe he may have stopped in that night for a few minutes, maybe not. I'm not sure about that. But I know that Natalie had invited him for a cruise that weekend aboard their boat, the Splendor, and which she always did. Whenever she worked with um, various co-stars, same with Robert Wagner, they would have their co-stars and stars and colleagues aboard the boat for pleasure cruises. And that's what Natalie did to get a jump start on the holiday weekend. She wanted to shop in Avalon at Catalina Island, and she invited Christopher Walken. So it was Friday the day after Thanksgiving when the cruise began. And even when the three of them, Christopher Walken, Robert Wagner, and Natalie, walked up the dock, Dennis could see the tension. This was not your everyday, usual cruise that they had when they brought out their co-stars. It seemed that Robert Wagner really had a problem with Christopher Walken being the guest on this particular weekend. Uh, because, uh, because you know, obviously, we, we, he was a very jealous individual. I believe he even put in his memoir that he was a very jealous individual. Yes, he did. Robert Wagner tells the truth about it, how th <laughs> there were many times he was very jealous of Natalie. But I believe, from all of my research, because I just didn't tell Dennis's story, I went deep into this story, and I believe that Robert Wagner was more jealous of Christopher Walken's Hollywood status just as much jealous of that as he was of Natalie and Christopher yeah. Walken, even though there was nothing going on uh, and, between and, the two of them. And to paint the picture for my audience, Christopher Walken just got off of receiving the Academy Award for The Deer Hunter. So he was yes. on fire. His career was on fire. Everyone wanted to sign Walken at the time. He was the hot new rising star of Hollywood. Right. And Robert Wagner had just moved back to TV and he had a popular show, Heart to Heart, Robert right, Wagner, right. on TV at the time. But it still wasn't that Natalie Wood status of Hollywood, the Hollywood great, the classics. That's what Robert Wagner always wanted for his career. And he never achieved it. But Christopher Walken had with just a few movies. Right, right. So, so let's set the scene. So they, they, they went sailing. And now I believe they, they, all, did they, all, go, they all went to the, um, the island for drinks, Catalina. On Friday, they went to Catalina Island, Avalon, um, and that's where they anchored. And Christopher Walken, R.J., and Natalie, they, Robert Wagner's nickname was R.J., they went ashore to have lunch at the pavilion, and then they did some early Christmas shopping. They came back to the boat Friday night. Dennis had cooked a steak dinner and they dined aboard the boat. Then suddenly after dinner on Friday night of the cruise, Robert Wagner wanted to move the boat to the other end of the island where it's very desolate. There's only one restaurant. It's called Two Harbors. It was terrible weather. Mm. It, the weather was so bad, Dennis had asked them, please don't even take this trip. But they were insistent upon taking it. 
So Natalie was against that. There was no need to move the boat near midnight. Well, it was about 1030 at night. And through choppy water, rainy, cold, and RJ and Natalie got into an argument on Friday night. Dennis asked Christopher Walken, hey, can you help me out here to calm this situation down? Walken went to his quarters, which was far forward, his cabin, and he suggested to Dennis, don't get involved in a marital spat. Just leave it alone. But Natalie came to Dennis and said, take me off the boat. We're going to the island. So Dennis took Natalie to Avalon, and they went right back to the bar that Natalie had been at earlier and then they got a room at the pavilion lodge and dennis and net well they got two rooms but dennis stayed in natalie's room as a platonic friend that's how right, close right. he was to her and as a bodyguard capacity too and natalie was up half the night just you know saying how frustrated she was with rj's drinking how she wasn't going to tolerate it anymore she couldn't take the jealousy she was very upset and angry that night and afraid because why would he want to move the boat in the dark night across right. the island to a place where, you know, there's hardly any activity. At least in Avalon, there's the stores and everything they could do the next, you know, shop the next morning. So Dennis spent the night with Natalie. Natalie was so angry she wanted to get a seaplane the next morning to fly off the island back to the mainland. But she couldn't get in touch with her sister, Lana Wood. So she told Dennis, we're going back to the boat. And he didn't want to do it, but they did it. He said, all right, let's try to salvage this horrible weekend. Dennis was already considering it the weekend from hell. And they went back to the boat. Natalie cooked her special breakfast. Everybody had breakfast. Everything seemed fine. Um, but it was so strange. Nothing was said about what happened the night before. Hmm. And then RJ said, let's take the boat to two harbors at the Isthmus, where we were going to go last night, which they did. When they moored at two harbors, Natalie and Christopher took a shore taxi to the restaurant, Doug's Harbor Reef, early in the afternoon, oh, about mid-afternoon, to have cocktails. And then R.J. and Dennis followed about 5.30, 6 o'clock to join them for dinner. They started having dinner about 7 o'clock. About 9.30, R.J. wanted to leave the restaurant, even though Natalie wanted to stay. Uh, the dinner was very tense. There was... Um, R.J. was just so upset to be in this situation with Christopher Walken there. Hmm. They went back to the boat. Dennis tied up the dinghy at the rear of the boat, and everyone was in the main salon. Dennis joined them, opened a bottle of wine, and Natalie and Christopher were sitting on a sofa, and they were chatting. And then all of a sudden, R.J. grabbed the bottle of wine on the coffee table, picked it up, and as hard as he could, he smashed it on the coffee table. Hmm. Glass shattered everywhere. It was just a terrible scene. Now, that, that's very interesting that you mentioned that, Marty. Now, did he say this to the, to the investigators when they investigated him? Did he mention Absolutely that? Absolutely not. Wow. There, was a, there was a created story that they had ready for the investigators. Hmm. And that's why Natalie's death ended up being classified as accidental. Wow. Because R.J. had convinced Christopher Walken and Dennis to please stick to the story that nobody knows what happened. They had a pleasant weekend. There was some um, loud conversation after dinner aboard the boat. Right. And then... When R.J. went to check on Natalie, she disappeared. And that's the story that Wagner asked Dennis and Walken to tell. So it's a, not a, what happened. So after he shatters the bottle, what happens, it to, got worse. What happens to Christopher Walken and the ship's captain, Dennis Deverne? Mm -hmm. Where do they go? After the bottle smashing, Natalie was humiliated, and she told R.J., I'm mortified. I can't believe you did this. 
and she stormed off to her stateroom, which is at the rear of the boat, and then there's an open deck after her stateroom, the master's stateroom. Just so my just so my audience knows, these are the words from the captain, not Marley. Oh, these are the captain's right, words, right. yes. Everything on every part of this story that I am telling, Dennis Deverne has been polygraph tested on by the LASD, the sheriff's department, and he has passed with flying colors. And after Natalie was so upset and went to her stateroom, walking, he was very upset and his hands were shaking. He hmm. went uh, forward to his cabin. He shut the door and he did not come out until morning when Natalie's body was found. So he really, truly knew what happened with the bottle smashing. But unless he heard what happened afterward, he was not a part of it. He was in his cabin. R.J. went and followed Natalie, and then the arguing started terribly in the stateroom. Dennis knocked on their stateroom door and asked them if everything was okay. R.J. opened the door just a few inches and stood between the door. Dennis did not see Natalie, and R.J. told him to go away. Leave, leave it alone. Mind his own business. So the arguing continued to be louder, and things sounded like they were being thrown around. Mm. And Dennis went up to the bridge right above their stateroom, and he put on music because the argument broke out to the rear deck. It was outside now. And Dennis just wanted to protect this couple he had come to know and love from other boaters overhearing the right, arguing right, right. and or to make them think he wasn't eavesdropping. So he turned on the music and you could still hear the yelling. And Dennis looked out. Natalie was in her nightgown. And then all of a sudden everything went quiet. He, Dennis couldn't hear yelling anymore. So what he did, he turned off the music and decided no matter what, he was going down to see what was going on. And never in a million years did it cross his mind that someone was going to end up hurt, let alone missing and found dead the next morning. But he went to the rear deck, and Robert Wagner was at the swim step, nervous, shaking, disheveled, sweating, and he told Dennis, Natalie's gone. You have to search the boat for her. Now, they had been drinking all night, right. too. Because all four Dennis, of Dennis them. stocked that, that boat pretty good. Yeah, well, they were drinking at the restaurant right. mostly. And then when they got back, they opened a bottle of wine. But that got smashed very fast. <laughs> but um, everyone had been drinking all day, pretty much. And... But so, but still, Dennis knew what a serious situation this was. But he still he couldn't fathom and understand what was going on here. Um, there was drinking, but it was no more than other social right. parties aboard that boat. And what, no one was fall down drunk. You don't right. know what you're doing. It was nothing like that. And what there was, was just what, drinking involved. What, what was Robert Wagner's reaction when Dennis came back and said she's not on the boat? Well, Dennis searched, and then they met up in the wheelhouse, and R.J. said, the dinghy is gone. She must have left. We're going to wait and see if she comes back. But Dennis knew that Natalie was deathly afraid of water. Natalie told the world she was deathly afraid of water. And Dennis knew she would never take the dinghy. She didn't even know how to operate the dinghy, even though Robert Wagner will um, tell in his books and you know, when he's talking that she did. Natalie never operated that dinghy. And Dennis knew something was wrong, so he wanted to turn on the searchlight. Robert Wagner wouldn't let him. Dennis wanted to call for help. Robert Wagner wouldn't let him. And still, Dennis is so confused, he doesn't know what to do at this point. Here's, you know, some people will say, well, why didn't he fight Robert Wagner? And what if he fought Robert Wagner and harmed him and Natalie came back? You know, you, right, people right. don't understand the situation that Dennis was really in at this point. And he loved both of them, mind you. He, this wasn't, you know, he trusted this man right. telling worked, him. He worked for him like for like seven or eight years. Seven years. Right. And he, he was a family member. His, you know, their kids called him Uncle Dennis. Hmm. And so they waited. And Dennis kept saying, let's call for help. Let's call for help. And Wagner said no. And finally, Dennis convinced Wagner at 1.30, call for help. So who does he call? He calls the restaurant. They get a little makeshift search going for Natalie, some of the island people. And about a half an hour later, the harbor master appeared, and 
they started looking for Natalie, and they found the dinghy probably around dusk. Or, or I'm sorry, dawn. It was the morning time. So I'm sorry, it, sorry to interrupt, Marty. But so, how long did it take for Robert Wagner, when Natalie would left the boat, went into the water to call the harbor master? What was the time? He never even called the harbor master. He called the restaurant. It took two and a half hours oh to call goodness. the restaurant. The harbor, um, the restaurant owner called the harbor master. Then the harbor master showed up, and then Robert Wagner wouldn't even call the coast guard, who needed to be called immediately when Natalie wasn't there. And so the harbor master called the coast guard. They showed up around 5:30 in the morning. And they found Natalie's body floating in her red down jacket at um, 7.45 in the morning. Oh First, God. they found the dinghy, yeah. So Robert Wagner tells the investigators, now, he would have you believe. Now, now I don't know about you, Marty, but if, if, if you're afraid of heights, you don't go skydiving. Okay? Exactly. So he would have you believe, and he told the investiga- investigating team, investigation team that she pretty much got up in the middle of the night because the dinghy was bouncing off the side of the boat and she couldn't sleep so her being so afraid of water she got up in her in nightgown with no shoes on and went to try to go disconnect it or whatever tighten it up a little bit that's what he would have everybody to believe that was the story that became the answer to natalie wood's mystery death and it's not a mystery anymore it's it's absurd no right, one would right. go out on a rainy deck without shoes on and to put the jacket on. and, and Or he also wanted people at first. One of the stories, first stories was that she was going out stargazing or going to the island. And then when the Coast Guard captain showed up, he told the Coast Guard captain, oh, I thought maybe she was going boat to boat, partying around. That's what she does. Natalie never did that. This man didn't know what answer to give, but by the time the investigators and the Coast Guard got there, he had come up with the story. The dinghy must have been banging. She went out to retie it, and that's what happened. She fell in and drowned. I, I think, and, I think, I'm sorry. I think the part that really gets so many people upset, because she was beautiful. She was in the prime of her life, the prime of her career. In the the the, the four hour wait, I mean, she could have been hanging on the dinghy for life. You don't know. We somebody she could have, have been hanging on the right. dinghy for life, and somebody could have grabbed her. So if somebody showed up early with some lights, they could have probably grabbed her. Which I always thought may have happened, but there was something that I did. See, Natalie was found in her nightgown, her jacket, and her socks, and just plain regular wool socks. And that's the thing that always made me think. Natalie, and no one that you would think professionals would have come up with this, but I did my own test in water wearing every kind of sock, but mostly wool socks in the ocean and different types of water. And with the slightest movement, the socks are off your feet within 30 seconds, Hmm. not, not even minutes, 30 seconds. Within a minute, those socks are not on your feet. So it always made me think that woman did not move in the water. But yet, I wanted to think, oh, if only they had done something, maybe she, which is horrible for her fear of water, that that's how she may have died, clinging alive to a dinghy. But that also became the answer for Natalie's, uh, all the bruises on her body. And there were over 24 bruises on her body. And, And I just couldn't fathom that. So the first year after her death, all this did not make sense to me, but I didn't really question Dennis because he never said anything to me about it, yet I knew he was a changed man. And I suspected from day one, when no one heard from him, Dennis couldn't even call his mother or brother per per RJ's instructions. He was not to contact family members, friends. He became almost like a prisoner in RJ's house for a year. Mm. And he went along with everything. Now, right, mind right. you, too, there's a lot of powerful people involved here. Uh, there were some death threats that came Dennis's way. One time when he wanted to stay at his girlfriend's house one night at, when living with R.J., R.J. sent his bodyguards, and they literally dragged Dennis down the sidewalk to put him in a car and take him back to Wagner's house by 10 o'clock, which was lockdown time, meaning your, his actual bedroom was locked. 
And then R.J. got Dennis a job. It's such a fascinating, unbelievable right, right. story. But he got him a job on Heart to Heart as a general um, extra actor. That way he could watch Dennis in the daytime. He wasn't doing any of this for Dennis, and Dennis wanted to work. Dennis was, you know, there was not payoff money. Dennis worked. He still maintained the boat. He got the boat ready for sale. He, he worked. He went to work to, at the studios. He was grateful for the job. But the guilt ate away at him. And that's finally, after a year, he called me and said, Marty, I need your help. I have to get out of L.A. I trust you. I need someone I can trust. And I worked for newspapers and was writing, and he wanted me to start writing everything down at that time so when people ask us why did you wait 30 years and how does he remember everything from 30 years ago everything dennis told me was acquired all of that information was acquired shortly after natalie died mm. and then i learned more as the years went on and then when no one would do anything about it I finally started doing my own investigation and was just simply appalled at the, the, Natalie's investigation in 1981 was one of the worst ever investigated in American history. And I, even the detectives on the case now agree with me on that. Hmm. And also bear in mind, folks, and you know, that this wouldn't be the first time that Hollywood has covered up a famous murder or for a famous actress or an actor. He was no. a very he was a very powerful man, like you said. Um, so the harbor master shows up, and what happens? What does Dennis said happened? After that, when uh, they found Natalie's body, they R.J. asked Dennis to identify Natalie. Imagine that he wouldn't right, even right. identify his own wife. And um, R.J. and Christopher Walken, they were given a helicopter through the sheriff's department and flown off the island. When they landed in, in Newport, they met up with Detective Razor, who was on his way to investigate, who didn't even check their bodies. But at that point, the detective didn't even know. Natalie had so many bruises on her body. But he didn't even ask questions. He said, go home and grieve, Mr. Wagner. I'll get back to you later. So, when so, he got so, so yeah. sorry. So this is Robert Wagner. So my audience knows this is Robert Wagner and Natalie Wood's second time being the second time being married. Okay, now I, I you know, obviously he must have loved her at some point. I mean, being so distraught that what happened to his the love of his life, Robert Wagner took a helicopter back to his Beverly Hills mansion and lawyered up. That's exactly what he did, and everyone was blinded by the celebrity of the case, right. that Robert Wagner could not harm Natalie Wood, even when they saw the, her body and the bruises on her body and the way she was dressed, nightgown, socks, and a, and a coat. They still didn't get it. If not for that coat, there's another thing. Uh, Dennis believes Robert Wagner put the coat on Natalie hmm. because she was on that deck in her nightgown and everything went silent and suddenly she's found with a coat on. And I don't know if Wagner, this is all presumption, but did he presume that the coat would sink her, therefore maybe never be found? Or did he want it to make it look like she was leaving the boat? That's only in the mind of the person who was with Natalie and knows exactly what happened in that part of this story. But Natalie was found with that coat on, but that coat is made of down and floats. Another thing that the original coroner Noguchi said, that the coat dragged her down, it weighed so much in the water. Right. If not for that coat, Natalie Wood may not have been found for weeks where you wouldn't have even seen the bruises or Amazing. maybe Amazing. never. Marty, so I... I yeah, I'm sorry. Go I'm sorry. ahead. <laughs> Mario, I want to play some rare audio that we found. Um, this was in the podcast of uh, the podcast of the Fatal Voyage. Um, this is actually Lana Wood, sister of Natalie Wood. Uh, um, I'm sorry, approaching Robert Wagner to talk about what happened that night and why he's not talking to people. Play that clip for me, will you, Justin? RJ, I just wanted to ask you one. Sorry, I know the pain that you're going through and that I'm going through. You know, I know this has not been any easier for you. I know that. But everybody is going to drive me absolutely insane Beg your pardon, until that? everybody knows, you know. Why won't you speak to the detectives? They're super guys. Clear well, yourself you if you even, can. Why would you even bring up anything like that? 
scrutinize what you've done. No, what have I done? I have talked to everybody. What, what do you, you? I don't know. Kevin and of, Ralph. Keep, you, I don't you, accuse you, you of anything. You accuse me of murdering her, of taking all these positions. It's incredible. I can't believe that you'd do something like that. I just can't believe. It. But RJ, you you've changed your story. I have changed. You've never anything. said anything to me. I you have never, never changed anything. You never for one minute stopped and said, "This is what happened." I know it's going to hurt I did. me. No, to, me, I, of course no, have, to me, of you course didn't. I have stopped and said what happened. No, RJ, you there really did Every Everybody. He says that he, he spoke to everybody. Did he actually speak to the investigators, all the investigators? No. An attorney handled everything for Robert Wagner after he got back to his house in 1981, and he hired an attorney for Dennis who wrote Dennis's statement, and Dennis was told to sign it and not ask questions. And he was told to not answer any questions to the detective. So he did not. So, no, he spoke with no one. Amazing. When the case was reopened in 2011, and our book, Dennis's our book, Goodbye Natalie, was published in 2009, and I sent a copy of it to the sheriff's department, and I didn't hear back because I had spoken with the original detectives on the case and told them I would not allow the book to be published if only they would take another look at the case, and they refused. So after that, I still knew we're, we're nowhere further, even with the book published. So what I did was gather testimonial statements from everyone I had interviewed, and I wrote a report of all of my own private investigation and sent it with a petition an attorney had started to get the case reopened. He, uh, this attorney had read our book, and we put this package together, sent it to the LASD. They called within two weeks and reopened Natalie Wood's case in 2011. And Robert Wagner, since that day, has not spoken with them, won't cooperate with them, and, just, and has hired a criminal defense attorney. Amazing. Um, Marty, I want to get back to Dr. Noguchi because, you know, there were, like you said, folks, there was like 25 bruises on her body. That, I mean, that, that sh should tell you something, that there might have been some, you know, scuffling going on. But Dr. Noguchi never, I mean, routine, never looked under her fingernails for skin. They true? never did fingernail scrapings. Right. They, they lost evidence. They didn't do it. And the most crucial part that they overlooked, because... When the case was reopened, the first thing they did was have a new coroner go over Natalie's autopsy report. And what they discovered missing from the first autopsy was that Natalie had over 300 cc's of um, urine in her bladder when found, which indicates Natalie was never conscious in the water, what I had always thought because of those socks. So how, did, how does an unconscious body get into the water? This really raised questions for them, and they changed Natalie's death certificate from accidental to un, undetermined causes mm. in uh, 2012. Mm. And now the case is still being worked. It's still open. Witnesses have come forward that corroborate Dennis DeVern's story, they heard the fighting, too, and they didn't come forward in 1981 just because media, they didn't, want, they didn't want to be involved. They figured if the case was closed, they had investigated. But it was a horrible investiga investigation in 1981. Now, did anybody from the, the, the restaurant that they went to, did they, when they reopened the case, did they speak with them? They spoke with everyone. They went to the island. They spoke with the Coast Guard captain. And, of course, mainly they spoke with Dennis. And they polygraphed tested Dennis. And they, <clears throat> excuse me, they took Dennis to the Splendor, which is based, still in Natalie Wood condition, actually. The new owner that had it kept it in its original condition. And they had Dennis recreate the scene for them. Oh, wow. And everything that Dennis told makes sense. And even the detectives say it. So what's the problem? Why don't they arrest Robert Wagner? They named him. Just this year, the main person of interest in Natalie Wood's death, but they need to have a DA 
who's not so concerned about high pressure cases and you know having a loss when oj simpson was found not guilty that that just changed the whole dynamic of the type of cases la uh, da's will take on it's a celebrity case it factors into it and it's just going to remain that way and all they want is for robert wagner to talk with them and he won't right. do it so um, unless something else happens you know we're I, at this I, point right now i want to talk marty about we talked about you know robert wagner was in you know, pretty much pretty much at the height of, of his celebrity um, he, was, he had a lot of contacts in Hollywood, and maybe the LAPD want to sweep it under the rug real quick because of the media attention. Now, uh, tell me about the letter that Frank Sinatra wrote to Dr. Noguchi. That's a good question because a lot of people don't know about that. Right. Frank Sinatra basically was just protecting celebrity as well. Noguchi was always under fire. He was known as the coroner to the stars. He had done Janis Joplin's autopsy, Marilyn Monroe, and and many other famous people. And he always hyped it up. So Hollywood, uh, telling personal information. Now, what connects to this is William Holden, who was... The, the male friend of Stephanie Powers, who starred with Robert Wagner in Heart to Heart, he died two weeks before Natalie, and he had been drinking and yes. fell out of his bed, hit his head, hit his on, head on a head table, and fled to death. Right. And so Noguchi hyped that up a lot, and Hollywood was very upset with this personal information that Noguchi was giving out. So Noguchi was watching what he was saying. Noguchi actually did come out when Natalie died and and did mention an argument on board. And that's when uh, Frank Sinatra wrote the letter that Noguchi is telling too many personal items about death. Sinatra just figured, just like everybody else did, that this had to be an accident. Of course, Robert Wagner would never harm Natalie Wood, but there was a lot of animosity in that man's mind, uh, Robert Wagner's mind. He really was angry with Natalie at that time. But Frank Sinatra wrote the letter, and two weeks later, there was Noguchi was under such fire from all of the higher-ups that he clammed up called Natalie Wood's death an accident, and everything was swept under the rug. Hmm. And a little bit later, Noguchi did get fired, not long oh. after Natalie's death. And he called me because he knew by that time that I was working with Dennis DeVern, and he wanted me to talk to Dennis to try to get Dennis to go to court for him so he could get his job back because there had been an argument on board. It's a just a... The, such a twisted, right, mangled right, right. story, and what I try to do is bring clarity to it. I want to talk about Christopher Walken because we talked earlier in the interview that you know everybody got together with the story. When they reopened yes. the case, did Christopher Walken say that he heard arguing? Christopher Walken absolutely cooperated with the detectives on the reopened Natalie Wood case. They met with him. Of course, he had an attorney with him, but he did corroborate a lot of Dennis DeVern's story, his account. Their accounts match up until the part that Christopher Walken went to his cabin, closed his door, and didn't come out for the rest of the night. And when Dennis searched the boat for Natalie, of course, he looked in Christopher Walken's room, and Christopher did look like he was sound asleep mm. after drinking for the night, and Dennis really believes that Walken was asleep in his cabin. Mm. Uh, if he heard anything, I don't know if he told the detectives that. Right. So his story, matched, did it match Dennis's story? Yes. Yes, it did, mm. up until the bottle smashing. So just to give my audience, I mean, what happened that night, like you said, we talked about the alcohol was involved and the, the argument, the, gla- the bottle gets shattered. Um, like you said, Robert Wagner was a very, very jealous individual. Um, you know, you got the hottest star in Hollywood, Christopher Walken right now, I mean, on your ship, and, you know, he's jealous. So talk about what happened between him and Warren Beatty. With Warren Beatty, Wagner... Wagner actually let Natalie take the rap 
for the fall of their first marriage. They were married in 1956, I believe it was. They got divorced in 1960. But Natalie had been filming Splendor in the Grass with Warren Beatty, and she didn't even like Warren Beatty when she started wa working with him. He seemed very arrogant. He wasn't cooperative. But then she grew an appreciation for him. He really seemed talented, and his ideas seemed to work on, on the set. So Natalie did warm up to him. But um, Warren Beatty was engaged to Joan Collins at the time. And Natalie left that alone. She was having trouble with um, RJ at the time, but she was working on Splendor in the Grass. And that was when one night, while she went to bed early and RJ hadn't come to bed in their home, she got up and went to the living room, and she caught R.J. in a compromising position with the family butler. <laughs> and that was it. Natalie went screaming. She was literally screaming and crying when she ran out the front door. And this is a story, of course, all of this these days is called hearsay because Natalie is not here anymore. But Natalie told this story to her sister, who I've come to know and appreciate so much, Lana Wood. And Natalie went home to her parents' house, and Lana was younger then and didn't really know what was going on, but she knew Natalie was not with R.J. anymore. And then later, sisters confided with each other, and Natalie told Lana this story. But that's why Natalie and R.J.'s first marriage broke up. Natalie really couldn't get over that. She hmm. really felt um, so betrayed, and was they there, broke up. Was there an incident with a, with a gun with Warren Beatty? Well, after that, I believe that's a fake story that R.J. put in his memoir right. that was released a few years back just to make it look like he's jealous, but he would never really hurt anybody. He can get mad, but really wouldn't go through with something like that because of the timing of that he tells it. From what my research shows, that Warren Beatty was in Europe at the time hmm. that R.J. says this happened. But um, he, R.J. let Natalie take the rap, and, and, and all of the media at the time was saying R.J. and Warren Beatty had an affair. They didn't even get together until after R.J. and Natalie broke up. And then uh, Natalie had her, her relationship with Warren Beatty. And if R.J. went to his house with a gun... Uh, that was just, again, jealousy for who Warren Beatty was becoming, in my opinion. Right. So Robert Wagner, I believe, is 88, almost 89 years old. Um, yeah. You know, he, 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 correct me if I'm wrong, he is not required by law, unless he's ch officially charged, to speak with anyone. Even if he's charged, he's not required by right. law to speak with anyone because you're you know the Miranda warning exactly. anything you say can and will be held against you so that's why he is being advised I'm sure right now by his criminal defense attorney to not say anything but if there was a grand jury then he would have to talk and that's my next step that's what I'm trying to get media and a few others involved with to try to convince the powers that be to please gather a grand jury on this case. Natalie Wood deserves her true justice. I can give her closure, but I can't give her her true justice, and she deserves it. It deserves to be attached to her legacy. Hmm. Yeah, because, it, like you said, as soon as they reopened the case, so many people came forward. From what I understand, is close to 100 people came forward. 100 witnesses. Wow. With information that lends toward R.J. being re responsible for Natalie Wood's death. And he's 88 years old. They... I've spoken with psychiatrists and psychologists, and every single one of them, from just the information out there in the media, have told me this is a true sociopath out there. Wow. Amazing. Amazing, amazing story. It's such a tragic story. And, you know, Marty, a lot of people, they're so fascinated by fame and celebrity, but these people, a lot of these people are severely flawed. 
Mike They're flawed. They really and, are. and you know, what? the only thing he's got left, he blames the messenger. He blames Dennis. When we did this podcast that you thank you for mentioning, he called us despicable people. Dennis and Lana Wood are despicable. Uh, what's more despicable than being named by authorities, the person of interest in your wife's death? That's all he's got on us is that we're despicable. Right. Prove us wrong, then. Did he Go an... talk to the authorities. Right. Prove we're despicable. If you're innocent, why not talk to the authorities? Exactly. And, and we're not. We're very, very average type of people. I just feel like I, I did the right thing in this case. And Dennis, he's so relieved since, you know, he was able to tell the truth. He did not want to take that to his grave. Hmm. Amazing. Amazing story. Um, fascinating story. Um and um, there's so many unanswered questions still still remain to this day. I mean, in Dennis, so Dennis, can, what does Dennis think actually happened that night? In his honest opinion, Dennis does believe that Robert Wagner is responsible, actually putting Natalie in the water. And Dennis is saying it now. He's not holding that back. He was there up until the minute, the minute Natalie was missing, heard everything, and didn't see. Her get into the water, which is a catch-22 right here, but he pretty much knows that's what he was hearing when he was on his way down to that swim step where Robert Wagner was standing. Hmm. And, and, go ahead. and he knows that Natalie didn't release that dinghy, so he knows Walken was in his room, and he knows he didn't do it, so he knows Robert Wagner had to be the person to do it. Hmm. And, and for, for Lana Wood, I mean, I, I, what are her thoughts? She is a, still, to this day, a devastated sister. She misses Natalie. Natalie meant the world to her. They were very close. Wagner will have you think differently on that, too. But Lana was Natalie's go-to person and vice versa. And she misses her sister, and she wants the justice just as bad as everyone involved on the right end of this wants. And if I can, and that includes two detectives, yes. And if I can even ask, um, Jill St. John, the new wife of uh, Robert Wagner, has she spoken? Never. She stands by him. But now, someone who was there the minute someone's wife is buried, Jill St. John was there for Natalie's wake and then pretty much returned every day, I call it, with soup and sympathy. She hmm. would bring Robert Wagner some food, and she'd go up to his bedroom and talk with him. And she has announced, it's on a video, you could look it up on YouTube, their first date was Valentine's Day, 1982. That's basically 10 weeks after Natalie's wow. death. But Dennis lived in the house. They were dating within three weeks after Natalie's death. Wow. So, oh, you know, amazing. she moved right in. So after, now on, and it was Natalie's will left everything to RJ, and Natalie is the one who made the millions. Was this something? To, so she left. She left a lot of the clothing to. She left all of her clothing to Lana, and Robert Wagner makes that appear as if there's something wrong with Lana for having sold a lot of it. But it would fill a gymnasium, Natalie's clothes. <laughs> Lana had no choice but to, to sell it, and, you know, she sold it to different stores, and um, they resold it. But RJ just recently, with Natalie's two daughters, held an auction, and they auctioned off all kinds of Natalie Wood uh, items, letters, personal letters, her uh, awards. Who wouldn't want to, what daughter wouldn't want to keep her her mother's, you know, Academy Awards, or I'm sorry, her Golden Globe and a few other awards. Natalie was nominated for Academy Awards, but never won one. Right, 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 right. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's just, just a sad case all around, and um you know, Marty, thank you so much for doing this, folks. She has an incredible book with, with the captain that night with Dennis DeVern called Goodbye, Natalie, Goodbye, Splendor. There is also a 13-part podcast called The Fatal Voyage, The Mysterious Death of Natalie Wood, which is fascinating, fascinating. I, I promise you, please listen to that. You can find that on, on iTunes. And, um, Marty, what can I say? I mean, I, I wish you the best of luck with this, and um, hopefully the grand jury... Um, you know, I hope that that happens. And I just want to say thank you. And I just want to mention that our book, my and Dennis's book, Goodbye, Natalie, 
ends with uh, wanting the case to be reopened. And so much has happened since the case was reopened. And I am now, and I hope to finish soon, the book that I hope will bring Natalie Wood her closure, a lot of the information that I just spoke with you about. Thank yeah. you so much, Mike. Oh, this has been great. Thank you so much. And I, I, I hope that it comes to fruition for you, and I believe it will. Because like, like we said, there's so many new witnesses coming coming forward every probably every day now. And, um, you know, hopefully... Yes, that, and that, the public deserves to know. Maybe somebody saw something that night that, like Dennis, you know, he kept it to himself for 30 years, and maybe they'll come out with it. And uh, let's pray for that. And it's cause Natalie, hopefully. Natalie deserves that. And Marty, thank you so much for doing this. And I will put this all over social media. Um, so we'll definitely, um, hopefully, hopefully if they he gets thrown in jail, hopefully someday we'll have you back on. <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, Marty, I would love to have that. Thank maybe, you. Maybe we'll get Dennis on with us too as well. Yes. And he would be happy to do that too. He's just unavailable right now, but uh, thank you so much. Excellent. So th- thank you again, Marty. And uh, we will talk to you soon and good luck with everything. All right. Bye-bye. 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 All right, folks, that's our show. What a fantastic, fantastic show this week. Uh, my thanks to author Marty Rooley for joining me this afternoon. Um, so many, there's still so many unanswered questions as to what happened to Natalie Wood. Um, such a beautiful actress and such a talented actress as well. My new audience is tuning in. Um, you guys struck the pot of gold, folks, because this is one of the best shows on the radio, bar none. Each and every week, we have some of the biggest names in show business joining us. And also, we are doing famous Hollywood murder mystery shows, such as The Black Dahlia with LAPD detective Steve Hodell, and also the, the famous Ronnie Chasen murder, a uh, famous pu- Hollywood publicist who was murdered driving home from a pr- premiere. That was, that's up there as well. And uh, we have some lined up that you guys are going to be guys gonna flip out so um thank you so much for joining us folks please visit soundcloud and type in wntn that's wntn for all my shows or they're all up there some great shows from last week we had uh who who do you have justin we had uh steve hodell's up there tom dreesen's up there uh johnny russo's up there um this episode will be up there as well um, so again, please go to SoundCloud, type in WNTN and follow my, my Facebook page at Real Talk with the Hollywood Kid. That's R-E-E-L, Real Talk with the Hollywood Kid. Um, the show is really starting to build up some steam and I can, you can sense it on social media. So thank you for tuning in and thank you for the comments. Thank you for the sharing. Thank you for the like. Um, again, folks, the best show on the radio. Where are you going to hear, sto- hear stories like this? You guys actually get, gain some knowledge when you listen to this show, unlike the other junk that's out there. I mean, geez, what do you want to listen to, sports radio all day? Listen, this is the best show, Real Talk with the Hollywood Kid. Tell your family, tell your friends, tell your neighbors, tell the mailman, tell the UPS guy, tell the, tell the, tell the Amazon guy now. Tell the Amazon guy, too. Okay, this is the best show on the radio now. We will see you every Saturday from 2 to 3 right here on AM 1550 WNTN. We'll see you next week.